Okay. Uh, next, I would love to welcome on Neve Simpson. His pronouns are they, them. <laughs> Whew, hi, everyone. This is terrifying. My name is Neve. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm an illustrator and organiser. And before I start, I'd like to thank Trans Activism UK for organising this demonstration and for their ongoing support and solidarity against the harm being done by the BBC and UK media in general. <laughs> Today, I will be covering topics that for many of us it is upsetting and exhausting to hear about. I include them to speak to the precarity of existing world trans, and I believe it's necessary to bring up. But if at any point you would like to remove yourself from the space, that is more than understandable. When the trans community is discussed in British media, there's a particular word that crops up again and again. This word is used disingenuously, fallaciously, poisoning the well of every think piece it touches. That word is debate. Oh. The Guardian describes the polarised debate on transgender and women's rights. The Week warns of the trans debate, a fiercely fought battleground in the nation's culture wars. In a BBC article detailing choreographer Rosie Kaye's resignation after transphobic conduct, including asking two non-binary employees to confirm their genitals at her dinner table, Katie Razzle wrote, In the end, it's perhaps just the latest example of the toxic nature of the debate around one of the most divisive issues of current times. It speaks to a very distinct flavour that British transphobia leaves on the tongue. The weaponization of the language of debate, and in particular the prioritizing of civility over civil rights. I'm from Oxford. I lived there, I studied there, and I have first-hand experience of the fetishizing of fostering debate at the expense of vulnerable people's safety. I saw the Oxford Union platform fascists like Marine Le Pen and Steve Bannon with the stated aim of stoking discussion and championing freedom of speech. As students protested outside, counter-protesters threw Nazi salutes and yelled anti-Semitic slurs. Le Pen and Bannon's ideologies posed a direct existential threat to marginalized groups, emboldened fascist sympathizers to commit acts of aggression. Yet, because they were presented as simply a contribution to an academic exercise, they were expressed unimpeded and unchallenged and received a cushy welcome at the member's bar to boot. Rational discussion, reasoned debate, difference of opinion, these are the phrases that were used then, as now, to present views that limited the fundamental human rights of others as merely academic. Protest, and you are simply a disruptor, arguing with your heart rather than your head. But that's not really the case, is it? Because Oxford, and institutions like it, that claim to ostensibly prize these principles above all else, are not the neutral parties they claim to be. British academia, as it currently stands, a cesspit of elitism maintained and funded from the coffers of wealth hoarders and colonizers. We know this to be the case. <laughs> However, to those that hold power, associations with the Oxford Union carry with it an instant cultural clout, regardless of how execrable the views you express happen to be. The same is true of British media. Outlets like the BBC are national institutions with cultural credibility and consistently present themselves as impartial ones. The BBC, incidentally, counts amongst its higher-ups Director General Timothy Davy, a former Tory chairman, and Chairman Richard Sharp, former advisor to Boris Johnson. It is dishonest to argue that there is no agenda behind what the BBC puts out and what it chooses to omit. When Caroline Lowbridge gets to publish a hateful article based on the self-fulfilling survey of a transphobic hate group, when Kathleen Stock gets to do an entire press junket to discuss her silencing, which is a funny term for voluntarily quitting over peaceful student protest, or when Rosie Kay is given a full interview while her employee's open letter isn't even shown, that is a conscious choice. The problem with the British media's understanding of neutrality is that to them, neutral is synonymous with cis. They present trans identity as a stance rather than another way of being human, an opposing force to be argued against. And so, the British public, and in particular British lawmakers, come to see this as the status quo. To them, trans people cannot simply exist. We must justify our existence in the public arena, in a debate format inherently dehumanizing, because it assumes a fundamental aspect of our personhood is up for discussion. Cis transphobes can speak on trans issues uninterrupted, while on the vanishingly rare occasions when trans perspectives are heard, it must be while sharing a stage with someone that denies their right to exist. 
Across mainstream UK media in 2020, there were 324 articles written about trans people. Of those, zero were written by trans people themselves. The woeful lack of trans perspectives in UK media allows transphobic journalists to present hatred as neutrality, spreading rhetoric that gets trans folks killed with impunity under the guise of discussion. Oh, the BBC isn't saying trans women are deluded predators, heaven forfend. We're merely starting a conversation about how some trans women might be deluded predators. Wait, where are you going? <laughs> Why won't you come back and engage in this extremely rational discourse? It's a cowardly game of I'm not touching you on a national scale, cloaking their bigotry in the language of objectivity. And this feeds into transphobic journalists' phony calls for civility. We are constantly told that we must be more civil, that our approach is too angry, aggressive, or toxic. If our right to exist is to be taken seriously, we must engage in civil discussion. It's a cynical appeal to the free marketplace of ideas when we know, as does any marginalized group, that the market cannot and never will be free while it's owned and operated by your oppressors. Our only choice is to upturn the stalls. The thing about civility is that those in power get to decide what's civil. Framing trans rights through the lens of debate is inherently irresponsible because we must argue for our existence on the terms and turf, no pun intended, of those who want us erased. Back home, I'm part of a union called ACORN. Our members fight against exploitation by landlords, letting agents and gentrifying forces. And we've proven time and again that direct action is what gets the goods. A friendly sit-down discussion doesn't get your house insulated or the mould off your walls because the playing field in that discussion was never even. Landlords know how to band together to protect their interests. Any legislation that protects you they see as a threat and they'll fight against it even if those measures are there for your safety. They know how to form advocacy groups, lobby policy makers and prevent you from doing the same. They know that in any bargain with you alone they have the chips and those of the state behind them. Now take what I just said and replace landlords with transphobes. Woo! Kathleen, St Woo! Kathleen Stock was one of the Guardian's faces of the year for 2021. Rosie Kay is currently being sent thousands of pounds in donations from TERFs. JK Rowling has yet another bland cinematic cash grab coming out. They're fine. Meanwhile, our trans siblings are potentially waiting years for gender-affirming medical care, unable to accurately document themselves subject to domestic abuse and housing discrimination. Whatever they would have you believe, we are overwhelmingly the ones under attack. They do not get to dictate how we behave in response. To present our right to exist as a mere difference in philosophy, as though the stakes are even for both parties, is to willfully ignore and actively contribute to the concrete threats trans people face every day. Speaking to The Guardian, when asked to respond to trans students who accuse her of making them feel unsafe, Kathleen Stock responded, whether you feel unsafe and whether you are unsafe are two different things. As philosophers, we constantly distinguish between appearances and reality, and my book is not actually making them physically unsafe. But the thing is, legislators read her book, the Tory backbenchers angling to give her a peerage read her book, and they read her coverage, and Kays, and Rowlings, and countless others. And before long, that waiting list gets a little longer, that gender recognition certificate a little harder to attain, that bill a little easier to block. So, let's talk about appearance and reality, shall we? Since the BBC ostensibly prides itself on impartiality, I will now list, without emotive language or extrapolation, a series of objective facts. On the 26th of October 2021, Caroline Lowbridge published an article entitled We're Being Pressured Into Sex by Some Trans Women. The original version of this article featured cis sex worker Lily Cade, who has been repeatedly accused of rape and sexual assault by former colleagues. The BBC had been informed of Cade's conduct by Chelsea Poe before the publication of the article, but omitted Poe's contribution and platformed Cade regardless. Cade then published a blog post calling for the mass extermination of trans women. The BBC removed Cade's contribution, but the editor's notes did not say whom they had removed or give specific reasons why. Here are some more objective facts. 2021 saw the deadliest year for our community on record, with 375 trans people recorded murdered worldwide and likely many more unreported. Of these, 96% were trans women or trans feminine people, overwhelmingly trans women of color. At least 175 of them were murdered in Brazil, where the BBC published Lobrida's article in Brazilian Portuguese. Same. 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 
In the UK, violent transphobic hate crimes this year are set to exceed the totals for 2019 and 2020. The 2020 Sexual Harassment Survey by the Government Equalities Office found 80% of trans people surveyed and reported experiencing at least one form of sexual harassment compared with an average of 53% of cis respondents. And I am deeply sorry that I have to put a number on our trauma to make them see us, but they need to know that the way we are presented has consequences. Our pain is not an exercise in theory. There is no possible metric by which trans people meaningfully threaten you, so why do you insist that these are the only stories worth telling? Why not talk about, why not talk about some other observable facts? Like the research by Cornell University found overwhelmingly that gender transition improves the overall well-being of transgender people. That 96% of trans people do not regret transitioning. And that among the positive outcomes of transition were improved quality of life, greater relationship satisfaction, higher self-esteem and confidence. Our pain is not an exercise in theory, but neither is our joy. Ultimately though, we should not need statistics to define ourselves. Arguing for your humanity to be recognized is such an odd position to be put in because the fact that it is in our breathing. I hope that someday this coverage will be viewed by the British public with the same embarrassment we feel watching the scaremongering representation of our cis queer comrades in decades past. It is as absurd to try and empirically prove our existence as it is to try and empirically prove your love for someone. That those realities are defined through feeling and acting doesn't make them any less credible than cold hard figures. To those of you standing here today, you are seen, you are sacred, you are loved. Whenever reading the headlines has made my heart sink, it's been lifted by seeing the everyday acts of solidarity that we show to one another. We are a community of mutual aid. We donate to crowdfunds, we share clothes, we provide shelter. We know that we cannot rely on our institutions to protect us, so we protect each other. And now we must do so harder than ever. If they will not give us a platform, we must make one. We must organize, we must advocate for ourselves, and we must not lose hope. Like the students that exercised their fundamental right to protest to hold Kathleen Stock to account. Like the dancers that spoke up about Rosie Kay's conduct as their employer. Your being here today is an act of extraordinary bravery. You are challenging cultural hegemony. You are refusing to be belittled and dehumanized. You are speaking truth to power. If our detractors are so intent on finding people too delicate to hear an opposing view, who turn tail and run to their echo chambers the second their ideas are challenged, maybe they should look in the fucking mirror. They are the reactionaries. We are the revolution. Thank you.